chapter seven of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven grant and meade field diversions seizing advantage ground grant and the wounded confederate grant's toilet in camp important dispatches through rain and mud grant and the dying soldier bad news on the morning of may thirteenth general grant expressed some anxiety as to the possibility of lee's falling back toward richmond without our knowing it in time to follow him up closely enough to attack him although it was thought that the almost impassable condition of the roads would probably prevent such an attempt skirmishers were pushed forward near enough to discover the meaning of a movement of some of the organization in lee's centre and it was found that the enemy was merely taking up a new position in rear of the works which had been captured from him there was no other fighting that day the general busied himself principally with inquiries about the care of the wounded and the burial of the killed he thought not only of the respect due the gallant dead but of proper rewards for the living whose services had contributed conspicuously to the victory he wrote a communication to the secretary of war in which he urged the following promotions meade and sherman to be major generals and hancock a brigadier general in the regular army wright and gibbon to be major generals of volunteers and carroll upton and mccandless to be brigadier generals in that service he had already promoted upton on the field but this promotion had to be confirmed in washington he said in his letter general meade has more than met my most sanguine expectations he and sherman are the fittest officers for large commands i have come in contact with an animated discussion took place at headquarters that day regarding general meade's somewhat anomalous position and the embarrassments which were at times caused on the field by the necessity of issuing orders through him instead of direct to the corps commanders the general-in-chief always invited the most frank and cordial interchange of views and never failed to listen patiently to the more prominent members of his staff he seldom joined in the discussions and usually reserved what he had to say till the end of the argument when he gave his views and rendered his decision it was now urged upon him with much force that time was often lost in having field orders pass through an intermediary that there was danger that in transmitting orders to corps commanders the instructions might be either so curtailed or elaborated as to change their spirit that no matter how able general meade might be his position was in some measure a false one that few responsibilities were given him and yet he was charged with the duties of an army commander that if he failed the responsibility could not be fixed upon him and if he succeeded he could not reap the full reward of his merits that besides he had an irascible temper and often irritated officers who came in contact with him while general grant was even tempered and succeeded in securing a more hearty cooperation of his generals when he dealt with them direct the discussion became heated at times at the close of the arguments the general said i am fully aware that some embarrassments arise from the present organization but there is more weight on the other side of the question i am commanding all the armies and i cannot neglect others by giving my time exclusively to the army of the potomac which would involve performing all the detailed duties of an army commander directing its administration enforcing discipline reviewing its court-martial proceedings etc i have burnside's butler's and siegel's armies to look after in virginia to say nothing of our western armies and i may make sheridan's cavalry a separate command besides meade has served a long time with the army of the potomac knows its subordinate officers thoroughly and led it to a memorable victory at gettysburg i have just come from the west and if i removed a deserving eastern man from the position of army commander my motives might be misunderstood and the effect be bad upon the spirits of the troops general meade and i are in close contact on the field he is capable and perfectly subordinate and by attending to the details he relieves me of much unnecessary work and gives me more time to think and to mature my general plans i will always see that he gets full credit for what he does this was a broad view of the situation and one to which the general mainly adhered throughout the war but after that day he gave a closer personal direction in battle to the movements of subdivisions of the armies 
general meade manifested an excellent spirit through all the embarrassments which his position at times entailed he usually showed his orders to general grant before issuing them and as their camps in this campaign were seldom more than a pistol shot distant from each other dispatches from the corps commanders directed to meade generally reached the general-in-chief about the same time in fact when they were together meade frequently handed dispatches to his chief to read before he read them himself as grant's combativeness displayed itself only against the enemy and he was a man with whom an associate could not quarrel without furnishing all the provocation himself he and meade continued on the best of terms officially and personally throughout this long and eventful campaign during the ten days of battle through which we had just passed very little relief physical or mental had been obtained but there was one staff officer a colonel blank who often came as bearer of messages to our headquarters who always managed to console himself with novel reading and his peculiarity in this respect became a standing joke among those who knew him he went about with his saddle-bags stuffed full of thrilling romances and was seen several times sitting on his horse under a brisk fire poring over the last pages of an absorbing volume to reach the denouement of the plot and evincing a greater curiosity to find how the hero and the heroine were going to be extricated from the entangled dilemma into which they had been plunged by the unsympathetic author than to learn the result of the surrounding battle one of his peculiarities was that he took it for granted that all the people he met were perfectly familiar with his line of literature and he talked about nothing but the merits of the latest novel for the last week he had been devouring victor hugo's les miserables it was an english translation for the officer had no knowledge of french as he was passing a house in rear of the angle he saw a young lady seated on the porch and stopping his horse bowed to her with all the grace of a chesterfield and endeavoured to engage her in conversation before he had gone far he took occasion to remark by the way have you seen lee's miserables anglicising the pronunciation her black eyes snapped with indignation as she tartly replied don't you talk to me that way they're a good deal better than grant's miserables anyhow this was retold so often by those who heard it that for some time after its repetition seriously endangered the colonel's peace of mind on the morning of the fourteenth it was decided to move the headquarters of generals grant and meade farther east to a position on some high ground three-quarters of a mile north of the nye river and near the fredericksburg and spotsylvania courthouse road the two generals and their staff officers rode forward on the massaponax church road and came to a halt and dismounted at a house not far from the nye river about half a mile south of that stream at a place near the gale house there was a hill held by the enemy which overlooked both the massaponax and the fredericksburg roads and as it commanded an important position it was decided to try to get possession of it just then general upton rode up joined the group and addressing himself to both generals grant and meade said with his usual enthusiasm and confidence and speaking with great rapidity i can take that hill with my brigade i hope you will let me try it i'm certain i can take it he was asked how many men he had left as his brigade had seen very hard fighting in the last few days he replied about eight or nine hundred men it was soon decided to let him make the attempt and general wright who was supervising the movement gave upton orders to start forward at once and seize the position upton put his brigade in motion with his usual promptness but the regular brigade had preceded him and captured the hill upton relieved the regular brigade and occupied the place but his possession of it was not of long duration the enemy sent forward a portion of mahoney's infantry and chambliss's cavalry and upton was compelled to fall back before superior numbers however there was no intention to allow the enemy to hold such an important position and meade directed warren to send one of his brigades to recapture it ayres brigade moved forward with spirit and the position was soon retaken and held general grant expressed to general meade his pleasure at seeing warren's troops making so prompt and successful a movement and as both officers had censured warren on the thirteenth they were anxious now to give him full credit for his present conduct 
general meade sent him the following dispatch i thank you and ayres for taking the hill it was handsomely done general wright then moved forward two brigades to relieve ayres this was the only fighting on that day while riding about the field general grant stopped at a house and expressed a desire to prepare some dispatches a number of wounded were lying upon the porch and in the rooms they had made their way there in accordance with the usual custom of wounded men to seek a house it seems to be a natural instinct as a house conveys the idea of shelter and of home i walked with the general into a back room to see whether there was a dry spot which he might take possession of for a short time to write messages and look over the maps as we entered there was seen sitting in the only chair a confederate corporal of infantry who had been shot in the right cheek just under the eye the ball coming out near the left ear a mass of coagulated blood covered his face and neck and he presented a shocking appearance he rose the moment we entered pushed his chair forward towards the general and said with a bow and a smile here take my chair sir general grant looked at him and replied ah you need that chair much more than i keep your seat i see you are badly hurt the officer answered good-naturedly if you folks let me go back to our lines i think i ought to be able to get a leave to go home and see my girl but i reckon she wouldn't know me now the general said i will see that one of our surgeons does all in his power for you and soon after he told one of the surgeons who was dressing the wounds of our own men to do what he could for the confederate the dispatches were afterward written in another room thirty-three years afterward i discovered that this corporal's name was w r thraxton and that he was in excellent health and living in macon georgia the enemy had now set to work to discover the real meaning of our present movements in the afternoon skirmishers pushed forward on our right and found that warren's corps was no longer there in the night of the fourteenth lee began to move troops to his right grant now directed hancock's corps to be withdrawn and massed behind the centre of our line so that it could be moved promptly in either direction when the general got back to camp that evening his clothes were a mass of mud from head to foot his uniform being scarcely recognizable he sat until bedtime without making any change in his dress he never seemed particularly incommoded by the travel-stained condition of his outer garments but was scrupulously careful even in the most active campaigns about the cleanliness of his linen and his person the only chance for a bath was in having a barrel sawed in two and using the half of it as a sort of sitz bath during most of this campaign the general like the staff officers used this method of bathing or as our english friends would say tubbing afterward he supplied himself with a portable rubber bathtub while campaign life is not a good school for the cultivation of squeamishness and while the general was always ready to rough it in camp yet he was particularly modest in performing his toilet and his tent fronts were always tied close and the most perfect privacy was secured when he was washing or changing his clothes while thus engaged even his servant was not allowed to enter his quarters the next day may fifteen the rain continued and the difficulties of moving became still greater important dispatches were received from the other armies they informed the general-in-chief that general averill's cavalry had cut a portion of the east tennessee railroad and had also captured and destroyed a depot of supplies in west virginia butler reported that he had captured some works near drury's bluff on the james river the next day the sixteenth came a dispatch from sherman saying that he had compelled johnston to evacuate dalton and was pursuing him closely sheridan reported that he had destroyed a portion of the virginia central and the fredericksburg railroads in lee's rear had killed general j e b stuart completely routed his cavalry and captured a portion of the outer lines of richmond he said he might possibly have taken richmond by assault but being ignorant of the operations of general grant and general butler and knowing the rapidity with which the enemy could throw troops against him he decided that it would not be wise to make such an attempt the loss of general stuart was a severe blow to the enemy he was their foremost cavalry leader and one in whom lee reposed great confidence 
we afterward heard that he had been taken to richmond and had reached there before he died that jefferson davis visited his deathbed and was greatly affected when he found that there was no hope of saving the life of this accomplished officer the continual rain was most disheartening on may sixteen grant wrote to halleck we have had five days almost constant rain without any prospect yet of its clearing up the roads have now become so impassable that ambulances with wounded men can no longer run between here and fredericksburg all offensive operations must necessarily cease until we can have twenty-four hours of dry weather the army is in the best of spirits and feels the greatest confidence in ultimate success the elements alone have suspended hostilities in the wilderness the army had to struggle against fire and dust now it had to contend with rain and mud an ordinary rain lasting for a day or two does not embarrass troops but when the storm continues for a week it becomes one of the most serious obstacles in a campaign the men can secure no proper shelter and no comfortable rest their clothing has no chance to dry and a tramp of a few miles through tenacious mud requires as much exertion as an ordinary day's march tents become saturated and weighted with water and draught animals have increased loads and heavier roads over which to haul them dry wood cannot be found cooking becomes difficult the men's spirits are affected by the gloom and even the most buoyant natures become disheartened it is much worse for an army acting on the offensive for it has more marching to do being compelled to move principally on exterior lines staff officers had to labor day and night during the present campaign in making reconnaissances and in cross-questioning natives deserters prisoners and fugitive negroes in an attempt to secure data for the purpose of constructing local maps from day to day as soon as these were finished they were distributed to the subordinate commanders great confusion arose from the duplication of the names of houses and farms either family names were particularly scarce in that section of the state or else the people were united by close ties of relationship and country cousins abounded to a confusing extent so many farmhouses in some of the localities were occupied by people of the same name that when certain farms were designated in orders serious errors arose at times from mistaking one place for another the weather looked a little brighter on may seventeen but the roads were still so heavy that no movement was attempted a few reinforcements were received at this time mainly some heavy artillery regiments from the defences about washington who had been drilled to serve as infantry on the seventeenth brigadier-general r o tyler arrived with a division of these troops numbering with the corcoran legion which had also joined nearly eight thousand men they were assigned to hancock's corps headquarters were this day moved about a mile and a quarter to the southeast to a point not far from massaponax church we knew that the enemy had depleted the troops on his left in order to strengthen his right wing and on the night of the seventeenth hancock and wright were ordered to assault lee's left the next morning directing their attack against the second line he had taken up in rear of the angle or as some of the troops now called it hell's half acre the enemy's position however had been strengthened at this point more than it was supposed and his new line of entrenchments had been given a very formidable character our attacking party found the ground completely swept by a heavy and destructive fire of musketry and artillery but in spite of this the men moved gallantly forward and made desperate attempts to carry the works it was soon demonstrated however that the movement could not result in success and the troops were withdrawn general grant had ridden over to the right to watch the progress of this attack while he was passing a spot near the roadside where there were a number of wounded one of them who was lying close to the roadside seemed to attract his special notice the man's face was beardless he was evidently young his countenance was strikingly handsome and there was something in his appealing look which could not fail to engage attention even in the full tide of battle the blood was flowing from a wound in his breast the froth about his mouth was tinged with red and his wandering staring eyes gave unmistakable evidence of approaching death 
just then a young staff officer dashed by at a full gallop and as his horse's hoofs struck a puddle in the road a mass of black mud was splashed in the wounded man's face he gave a piteous look as much as to say couldn't you let me die in peace and not add to my sufferings the general whose eyes were at that moment turned upon the youth was visibly affected he reined in his horse and seeing from a motion he made that he was intending to dismount to bestow some care upon the young man i sprang from my horse ran to the side of the soldier wiped his face with my handkerchief spoke to him and examined his wound but in a few minutes the unmistakable death rattle was heard and i found that he had breathed his last i said to the general who was watching the scene intently the poor fellow is dead remounted my horse and the party rode on the chief had turned round twice to look after the officer who had splashed the mud and who had passed rapidly on as if he wished to take him to task for his carelessness there was a painfully sad look upon the general's face and he did not speak for some time while always keenly sensitive to the sufferings of the wounded this pitiful sight seemed to affect him more than usual when general grant returned to his headquarters greatly disappointed that the attack had not succeeded he found dispatches from the other armies which were by no means likely to furnish consolation to him or to the officers about him siegel had been badly defeated at newmarket and was in retreat butler had been driven from drury's bluff though he still held possession of the road to petersburg and banks had suffered defeat in louisiana the general was in no sense depressed by the information and received it in a philosophic spirit but he was particularly annoyed by the dispatches from siegel for two hours before he had sent a message urging that officer to make his way to staunton to stop supplies from being sent from there to lee's army he immediately requested halleck to have siegel relieved and general hunter put in command of his troops general canby was sent to supersede banks this was done by the authorities at washington and not upon general grant's suggestion though the general thought well of canby and made no objection in commenting briefly upon the bad news general grant said lee will undoubtedly reinforce his army largely by bringing beauregard's troop from richmond now that butler has been driven back and will call in troops from the valley since siegel's defeated forces have retreated to cedar creek hoke's troops will be needed no longer in north carolina and i am prepared to see lee's forces in our front materially strengthened i thought the other day that they must feel pretty blue in richmond over the reports of our victories but as they are in direct telegraphic communication with the points at which the fighting took place they were no doubt at the same time aware of our defeats of which we have not learned till to-day so probably they did not feel as badly as we imagined the general was not a man to waste any time over occurrences of the past his first thoughts were always to redouble his efforts to take the initiative and overcome disaster by success now that his cooperating armies had failed him he determined upon still bolder movements on the part of the troops under his immediate direction as the weather was at this time more promising his first act was to sit down at his field desk and write an order providing for a general movement by the left flank toward richmond to begin the next night may nineteen he then sent to washington asking the cooperation of the navy in changing our base of supplies to port royal on the rappahannock End of chapter seven chapter eight of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight attempt to turn the union right bill grant's unprotected headquarters grant and the virginia lady a race for the north anna a noonday halt at mrs tyler's the fact that a change had been made in the position of our troops and that hancock's corps had been withdrawn from our front and placed in rear of our centre evidently made lee suspect that some movement was afoot and he determined to send general ewell's corps to try to turn our right and to put early in readiness to cooperate in the movement if it should promise success in the afternoon of may nineteen a little after five o'clock i was taking a nap in my tent to try to make up for the sleep lost the night before 
aides-de-camp in this campaign were usually engaged in riding back and forth during the night between headquarters and the different commands communicating instructions for the next day and had to catch their sleep in installments i was suddenly awakened by my colored servant crying out to me wake up sir for god's sake de whole of lee's army am in our rear he was in a state of feverish excitement and his face seemed two shades lighter than its ordinary hue the black boys were not to be blamed for manifesting fright for they all had a notion that their lives would not be worth praying for if they fell into the hands of the enemy and were recognized as persons who had made their escape from slavery to serve in the yankee army hearing heavy firing in the direction of our rear i put my head out of the tent and seeing the general and staff standing near their horses which had been saddled i called for my horse and hastened to join them upon my inquiring what the matter was the general said the enemy is detaching a large force to turn our right i wish you would ride to the point of attack and keep me posted as to the movement and urge upon the commanders of the troops in that vicinity not only to check the advance of the enemy but to take the offensive and destroy them if possible you can say that warren's corps will be ordered to cooperate promptly general meade had already sent urgent orders to his troops nearest the point threatened i started up the fredericksburg road and saw a large force of infantry advancing which proved to be the troops of ewell's corps who had crossed the nye river in the vicinity of the harris house about a mile east of the nye i found general tyler's division posted on the fredericksburg road with kitching's brigade on his left by meade's direction hancock had been ordered to send a division to move at double quick to tyler's support and warren's maryland brigade arrived on the ground later the enemy had made a vigorous attack on tyler and kitching and the contest was raging fiercely along their lines i rode up to tyler who was an old army friend found him making every possible disposition to check the enemy's advance and called out to him tyler you are in luck to-day it isn't every one who has a chance to make such a debut in joining an army you are certain to knock a brevet out of this day's fight he said as you see my men are raw hands at this sort of work but they are behaving like veterans hancock had arrived on the ground in person and when bernie's troops of his corps came up they were put into action on tyler's right crawford of warren's corps arrived about dark and was put in position on the left the brunt of the attack however had been broken by the troops upon which it first fell each regiment of tyler's heavy artillery was as large as some of our brigades these regiments had been thoroughly drilled and disciplined in the defences about washington but this was their first engagement and their new uniforms and bright muskets formed a striking contrast to the travel-stained clothing and dull-looking arms of the other regiments when the veterans arrived they cracked no end of jokes at the expense of the new troops they would cry out to them how are you heavies is this work heavy enough for you you're doing well my sons if you keep on like this a couple of years you'll learn all the tricks of the trade they were particularly anxious to get hold of the new arms of the fresh troops and when a man was shot down a veteran would promptly seize his gun in exchange for his own which had become much the worse for wear in the last week's rainstorms the fighting was exceedingly obstinate and continued until after nine o'clock but by that hour the enemy had been driven back at all points and forced to beat a rapid retreat across the nye his loss in killed and wounded was severe and we captured over four hundred prisoners from him we did not escape a considerable loss on our side six hundred of our men having been killed and wounded a staff officer passing over the ground after dark saw in the vicinity of the fredericksburg road a row of men stretched upon the ground looking as if they had lain down in line of battle to sleep he started to shake several of them and cried out get up what do you mean by going to sleep at such a time as this he was shocked to find that this row consisted entirely of dead bodies lying as they fell shot down in ranks with their alignment perfectly preserved the scene told with mute eloquence the story of their valor and the perfection of their discipline the brevet rank predicted for tyler was conferred upon him for his services in this engagement and it had been fairly won 
lee had evidently intended to make ewell's movement a formidable one for early had received orders to cooperate in the attack if it should promise success and during the afternoon he sent forward a brigade which made an assault on his front the attempt however was a complete failure this attack by ewell on the nineteenth prevented the orders previously issued for the general movement by the left flank from being carried out until the night of the twentieth the army of the potomac had been embarrassed by having too much artillery finding that the country through which it had to move was more difficult than had been supposed general grant gave an order on the nineteenth to send ninety-two guns back to washington the next morning may twenty the general was later than usual in making his appearance in consequence of having overslept finally his voice was heard calling from his tent to his colored servant bill ho bill what time is it the servant ran to him found he was still in bed and told him the hour in scarcely more than ten minutes the general appeared at the mess-table we were not surprised at the rapidity with which he addressed himself for we had learned by this time that in putting on his clothes he was as quick as a lightning change actor in a variety theatre when the officers at headquarters were called up particularly early to start on the march every one did his utmost to be on time and not keep the general waiting but however vigorous the effort no one could match him in getting on his clothes there was seldom any occasion for such hurried dress but with him it was a habit which continued through life bill the servant who waited on the general was a notable character he was entirely a creature of accident when the general was at cairo in eighteen sixty one bill suddenly appeared one day at headquarters with two other slave boys who had just escaped from their former masters in missouri they belonged to that class of fugitive blacks who were characterized by those given to artistic comparisons as charcoal sketches from the hands of the old masters bill was of a genuine burnt cork hue and no white blood contaminated the purity of his lineage he at once set himself to work without orders taking care of one of the aides and by dint of his force of character resisted all efforts of that officer to discharge him when any waiter was absent or even when all were present he would turn up in the headquarters mess tent and insist on helping the general at table then he attached himself to colonel boomer and forced that officer in spite of himself to submit to his services after the colonel had been killed in the assault on vicksburg bill suddenly put in an appearance again at headquarters and was found making himself useful to the general notwithstanding the protests of the other servants and before long he had himself regularly entered upon the general's private payroll when his chief came east bill followed and gradually took entire charge of the general's personal comfort as valet waiter and man of all work he was devoted never known to be beyond call had studied the general's habits so carefully that he could always anticipate his few wants and became really very useful i had a striking illustration one morning in front of spotsylvania of how devoted bill was to the general's comfort while we were camping in the region of wood ticks garter snakes and beetles i saw bill in front of the general's tent thrusting his hand first into one of the chief's boots and then into the other what are you doing that for bill i asked oh he explained i always feel around into general boots before i lets him put them on to see that no insects done got into them the previous night he followed in the general's shadow all through his presidential terms then he insisted upon attempting business in washington and afterward tried his hand at preaching but he had fed so long at the public crib that his appetite had been spoiled for any other means of sustaining life and he finally made his way into a government department as messenger where he still is and where it is hoped that his eventful life may be rounded out in the quiet and comfort to which his public services entitle him he will not be as dramatic an historical character as napoleon's mameluk but in his humble way he was as faithful and devoted to his chief as the famous rustan in discussing the contemplated movement to the left general grant said on the morning of may twenty my chief anxiety now is to draw lee out of his works and fight him in the open field instead of assaulting him behind his entrenchments the movement of early yesterday gives me some hope that lee may at times take the offensive and thus give our troops the desired opportunity 
in this however the general was disappointed for the attack of the nineteenth was the last offensive movement in force that lee ventured to make during the entire campaign the series of desperate battles around spotsylvania had ended but other soil was now to be stained by the blood of fratricidal war torbert's cavalry division began the march to the south on may twenty and as soon as it was dark hancock's corps set out for milford station a distance of about twenty miles to take up a position on the south bank of the Midapony. guinea station was reached the next morning after a night march of eight miles hancock's advance crossed the mattapony at noon and entrenched his position at ten o'clock that morning warren had moved south and that night he reached the vicinity of guinea station burnside put his corps in motion as soon as the road was clear of hancock's troops and was followed by wright generals grant and meade with their staffs took up their march on may twenty first following the road taken by hancock's corps and late in the afternoon reached guinea station our vigilant signal officers who had made every effort to read the enemy's signals now succeeded in deciphering an important dispatch from which it was learned that lee had discovered the movement that our forces were making hancock was now many miles in advance and the head of warren's corps was a considerable distance in the rear our party besides a small cavalry and infantry escort consisted entirely of officers many of them of high rank one might have said of it what curran said of the books in his library not numerous but select it was suggested by some that before pitching camp for the night the headquarters had better move back upon the road on which we had advanced until warren's troops should be met but general grant made light of the proposition and ordered the camp to be established where we were saying i think instead of our going back we had better hurry warren forward suggestions to the general to turn back fell as usual upon deaf ears while our people were putting up the tents and making preparations for supper general grant strolled over to a house near by owned by a mr chandler and sat down on the porch i accompanied him and took a seat beside him in a few minutes a lady came to the door and was surprised to find that the visitor was the general-in-chief he was always particularly civil to ladies and he rose to his feet at once took off his hat and made a courteous bow she was ladylike and polite in her behaviour and she and the general soon became engaged in a pleasant talk her conversation was exceedingly entertaining she said among other things this house has witnessed some sad scenes one of our greatest generals died here just a year ago general jackson stonewall jackson of blessed memory indeed remarked general grant he and i were at west point together for a year and we served in the same army in mexico then you must have known how good and great he was said the lady oh yes replied the general he was a sterling manly cadet and enjoyed the respect of every one who knew him he was always of a religious turn of mind and applauding hard-working student his standing was at first very low in his class but by his indomitable energy he managed to graduate quite high he was a gallant soldier and a christian gentleman and i can understand fully the admiration your people have for him they brought him here the monday after the battle of chancellorsville she continued you probably know sir that he had been wounded in the left arm and right hand by his own men who fired upon him accidentally in the night and his arm had been amputated in the field the operation was very successful and he was getting along nicely but the wet applications made to the wound brought on pneumonia and it was that which caused his death he lingered till the next sunday afternoon may ten and then he was taken from us here the lady of the house became very much affected and almost broke down in recalling the sad event our tents had by this time been pitched and the general after taking a polite leave of his hostess and saying he would place a guard over her house to see that no damage was done to her property walked over to camp and soon after sat down with the mess to a light supper the question has been asked why general grant in this movement left so great a distance between hancock's corps and the rest of his army he did it intentionally and under the circumstances it was unquestionably wise generalship 
he was determined to try by every means in his power to tempt lee to fight outside of his entrenched lines he had in the battles of the last two weeks thoroughly measured lee's capacity as an opponent and he believed it would be difficult to force him to take the offensive unless some good opportunity were offered he knew that lee from the distance over which he would have to move his troops could not attack the isolated hancock with more than an army corps such a force he was certain hancock could whip and grant being in close communication with the several corps felt that he could bring up reinforcements as rapidly as the enemy and that the chances would be greatly in his favor if he could thus bring on an engagement in the open field there was no question in his mind as to whipping his opponent the only problem was how to get at him the next morning may twenty two headquarters moved south following the line which had been taken by hancock's troops which ran parallel with the fredericksburg railroad the officers and men had never experienced a more sudden change of feelings and prospects the weather was pleasant the air was invigorating the sun was shining brightly and the roads were rapidly drying up the men had been withdrawn from the scenes of their terrible struggles at spotsylvania and were no longer confronting formidable earthworks the features of the country had also entirely changed though there were many swamps thickets and streams with difficult approaches the deep gloom of the wilderness had been left behind the country was now more open and presented many clearings and the range of vision was largely increased the roads were broad the land was well cultivated and the crops were abundant the men seemed to breathe a new atmosphere and were inspired with new hope it was again on to richmond and the many miles they were now gaining toward the enemy's capital and out of reach of fire made them experience that buoyancy of feeling which always accompanies the prestige of success but while the country was covered with farms and houses there was scarcely an inhabitant to be seen most of the able-bodied men were serving in the armies and the slaves had been driven farther south many of the non-combatants had gone away to escape the invading army and the only people encountered were women and children and old and decrepit men the corps were now rapidly moving toward hanover junction which is about twenty-five miles north of richmond lee notwithstanding his superior means of obtaining information had not begun to move until hancock's corps had crossed the mattapony at milford he then started rapidly down the telegraph road and as he had a shorter route than the union forces it appears that he reached hanover court house at the head of ewell's corps at nine thirty o'clock on may twenty second his telegrams and manoeuvres all go to show that he was entirely deceived in regard to grant's movements he reported at that time i have learned as yet nothing of the movements of the enemy east of the mattapony the day before in speaking of the position of grant's army he said i fear this will secure him from attack until he crosses the pamunkey even after grant had crossed the mattapony lee spoke of the union forces as being east of that river and was hurrying forward troops in order to prevent grant from crossing the pamunkey a stream formed by the junction of the north anna and the south anna rivers while grant was in reality moving toward the north anna in these movements lee was entirely outgeneraled on the morning of may twenty second hancock was instructed to remain at milford during the day while the other corps were directed to move south by roads which would not separate them by distances of more than four miles it appears to have been about midday of the twenty second when lee obtained information through his cavalry of our advance toward the north anna hancock could not well have reached hanover junction before lee for lee's route from the right of his entrenchments on the po to hanover junction by the telegraph road was about twenty-eight miles while the route of hancock's corps from anderson's mill to hanover junction via bowling green was about thirty-four miles besides as hancock was advancing with a detached corps through an enemy's country and over unknown roads he had to move with caution early in the afternoon general grant decided to halt for a couple of hours to be in easy communication with the troops that were following he selected for the halt a plantation which was beautifully situated on high ground commanding a charming view of the valley of the mattapony 
a very comfortable house stood not far from the road along which burnside's corps was marching in making halts of this kind a house was usually selected for the reason that good water was easily obtainable and facilities were afforded for looking at maps and conducting correspondence general grant never entered any of the houses as they were usually occupied by ladies and he did not wish to appear to invade their dwellings he generally sat on the porch when we reached this plantation the escort and the junior staff officers lounged about the grounds in the shade of the trees while general grant accompanied by two or three of us who were riding with him dismounted and ascended the steps of the porch a very gentle and prepossessing-looking lady standing in the doorway was soon joined by an older woman general grant bowed courteously and said with your permission i will spend a few hours here the younger lady replied very civilly certainly sir the older one exclaimed abruptly i do hope you will not let your soldiers ruin our place and carry away our property the general answered politely i will order a guard to keep the men out of your place and see that you are amply protected and at once gave the necessary instructions the ladies seeing that the officer with whom they were conversing was evidently one of superior rank became anxious to know who he was and the older one stepped up to me and in a whisper asked his name upon being told that he was general grant she seemed greatly surprised and in a rather excited manner informed the other lady of the fact the younger lady whose name was mrs tyler said that she was the wife of a colonel in the confederate army who was serving with general joe johnston in the west but she had not heard from him for some time and she was very anxious to learn through general grant what news he had from that quarter the general said sherman is advancing upon rome and ought to have reached that place by this time thereupon the older lady who proved to be the mother-in-law of the younger one said very sharply general sherman will never capture that place i know all about that country and you haven't an army that will ever take it we all know very well that sherman is making no headway against general johnston's army we could see that she was entertaining views which everywhere prevailed in the south the authorities naturally put the best face upon matters and the newspapers tried to buoy up the people with false hopes it was not surprising that the inhabitants of the remote parts of the country were in ignorance of the true progress of the war general grant replied in a quiet way general sherman is certainly advancing rapidly in that direction and while i do not wish to be the communicator of news which may be unpleasant to you i have every reason to believe that rome is by this time in his possession the older lady then assumed a bantering tone and became somewhat excited and defiant in her manner and the younger one joined with her in scouting the idea that rome could ever be taken just then a courier rode up with dispatches from washington containing a telegram from sherman general grant glanced over it and then read it to the staff it announced that sherman had just captured rome the ladies had caught the purport of the communication although it was not intended that they should hear it the wife burst into tears and the mother-in-law was much affected by the news which was of course sad tidings to both of them the mother then began to talk with great rapidity and with no little asperity saying i came from richmond not long ago where i lived in a house on the james river which overlooks belle isle and i had the satisfaction of looking down every day on the yankee prisoners i saw thousands and thousands of them and before this campaign is over i want to see the whole of the yankee army in southern prisons just then burnside rode into the yard dismounted and joined our party on the porch he was a man of great gallantry and elegance of manner and was always excessively polite to the gentler sex he raised his hat made a profound bow to the ladies and as he looked at his corps filing by on the road said to the older one who was standing near him i don't suppose madam that you ever saw so many yankee soldiers before she replied instantly not at liberty sir this was such a good shot that every one was greatly amused and general grant joined heartily in the laugh that followed at burnside's expense End of chapter eight chapter nine of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine 
grant crosses the north anna sheridan returns from his raid meeting between grant and burnside destroying a railroad the enemy reinforced a female oddity grant recrosses the north anna hancock's corps had been fighting and marching almost continuously for over a week both day and night and the halt on may twenty second was made to give a much-needed rest it was a curious study to watch the effect which the constant exposure to fire had produced upon the nervous system of the troops their nerves had become so sensitive that the men would start at the slightest sound and dodge at the flight of a bird or the sight of a pebble tossed past them one of their amusements in camp at that time was to throw stones and chips past one another's heads and raise a laugh at the act of dodging and bending the body low or jackknifing as the men called it this did not indicate any loss of courage it was merely an effect produced by a temporary physical condition which the men could not control and gave ample evidence of the nervous strain to which they had so long been subjected dodging the head under fire is often as purely involuntary as winking i have known in my experience only two men who could remain absolutely immovable under a heavy fire without even the twitching of a muscle one was a bugler in the cavalry and the other was general grant in the evening of the twenty second the general-in-chief issued written orders directing the movement of the troops for the next day the march was to begin at five o'clock in the morning and the several corps were to send out cavalry and infantry in advance on all the roads to ascertain the position of the enemy the purpose was to cross the north anna river west of the fredericksburg railroad and to strike lee wherever he could be found to understand the topography of the country it is necessary to explain that the north anna and the south anna run in an easterly direction at a distance from each other of eight or ten miles in the vicinity of the region in which grant's operations took place and unite and form the pamunkey river about five miles east of the line of the fredericksburg railroad this road crossed the north anna about two miles north of hanover junction the intersection of the fredericksburg and the virginia central railroads the telegraph road crossed the river by a wooden bridge half a mile west of the railroad bridge farther up the river there were three fords about a mile and a half apart hancock marched to the telegraph road bridge burnside to ox ford and warren to jericho ford wright followed warren burnside's corps used plantation roads which ran between the main roads which had been taken by the corps of hancock and warren hancock approached the river at the telegraph road bridge about noon he found the enemy holding an earthwork on the north side and saw a force posted on the opposite bank seeing the importance of gaining possession of the defensive work he determined to take it by assault and did so handsomely some of the enemy being captured and the rest driven over the bridge followed closely by our men the retreating force was thrown into great confusion and in the rush a number were crowded off the bridge and drowned burnside on reaching oxford found it held by the enemy strongly entrenched on the south bank of the river and no attack was made warren reached jericho ford soon after noon seized it laid a pontoon bridge and by four thirty p m had moved his whole corps to the south bank at six o'clock hill's corps attacked warren's line before his troops were all in position and forced it back some distance but the enemy was soon repulsed wright's corps was moved up to support warren but it was not deemed necessary to send it across the river until the next morning general grant rode during this day may twenty third with hancock's corps while halting in the afternoon at a house not far from the river he was told by the people living there that lee had rested for a few hours at the same house the day before and that his entire army had crossed the river on the morning of the twenty fourth hancock crossed to the south side crittenden's division crossed the river and joined warren's corps they advanced against the enemy with a view of dislodging him from his position at oxford but his lines were found so strong that after a brief encounter our forces withdrew they had not been able to take with them any artillery that night our whole army except one division of burnside's corps was on the south side of the river and close up to the enemy's lines 
general headquarters were established near chesterfield station on may twenty fourth that day sheridan returned from his memorable cavalry raid and was warmly greeted by general grant at headquarters and heartily congratulated about his signal success he related some of the principal incidents in the raid very graphically but with becoming modesty in describing a particularly hot fight he would become highly animated in manner and dramatic in gesture then he would turn to some ludicrous incident laugh heartily and seem to enjoy greatly the recollection of it it will be remembered that he started out suddenly on may eighth passed round the right of lee's army keeping out of reach of his infantry crossed the north anna on the ninth destroyed ten miles of the virginia central railroad together with cars locomotives and a large amount of army supplies recaptured three hundred and seventy five of our prisoners on their way from spotsylvania to richmond crossed the south anna struck the fredericksburg road at ashland and destroyed the depot many miles of road a train of cars and a large supply of army stores finding that the enemy's cavalry were concentrating he united his divisions which had been operating at different points in the work of destruction and fought a pitched battle at yellow tavern about seven miles north of richmond capturing two pieces of artillery mortally wounding the commander j e b stuart and killing brigadier-general james b gordon he then entered the advanced lines of entrenchments north of richmond crossed the chickahominy and reached haxall's landing on the james where he replenished his supplies from stores sent to him by butler after remaining there from the fourteenth to the seventeenth of may he started on his return to the army of the potomac he had lost only four hundred and twenty-five men in killed wounded and missing one important effect of sheridan's operations was that he compelled all of the enemy's cavalry to be moved against him which left our large train of four hundred wagons free from their attacks general grant at times had a peculiar manner of teasing officers with whom he was on terms of intimacy and in this interview he began to joke with his cavalry leader by saying to those who were gathered about him now sheridan evidently thinks he has been clear down to the james river and has been breaking up railroads and even getting a peep at richmond but probably this is all imagination or else he has been reading something of the kind in the newspapers i don't suppose he seriously thinks that he made such a march as that in two weeks sheridan joined in the fun and replied well after what general grant says i do begin to feel doubtful as to whether i have been absent at all from the army of the potomac sheridan had become well bronzed by his exposure to the sun and looked the picture of health it was seen at once that the general-in-chief did not intend to give him or his command any rest he told him of the movements he had in contemplation and sheridan saw that all his troops would be wanted immediately at the front that evening the twenty fourth general grant issued an order which he had been considering for some time assigning burnside's corps to the army of the potomac and putting him under the command of meade it was found that such a consolidation would be much better for purposes of administration and give more unity to the movements it had been heretofore necessary to inform meade of the instructions given to burnside and to let burnside know of the movements that were to be undertaken by meade in order that the commanders might understand fully what was intended to be accomplished and be in a position to cooperate intelligently this involved much correspondence and consumed time the new order was intended to avoid this and simplify the methods which had been employed while general grant was riding past the headquarters of burnside the next morning burnside came out of his tent and in company with several of his officers came up to general grant who had now halted by the roadside shook hands with him and said i have received the instructions assigning my command to the army of the potomac that order is excellent it is a military necessity and i am glad it has been issued this conduct of burnside gave the greatest satisfaction to the general-in-chief and he commented very favorably upon it afterward 
it must be recollected in this connection that burnside was senior in rank to meade and had commanded the army of the potomac when meade was a division commander under him and the manner in which burnside acquiesced in his new assignment and the spirit he manifested in his readiness to set aside all personal aims and ambitions for the public good were among the many instances of his patriotism and his absolute loyalty to the cause he served the general headquarters were moved farther west on may twenty five and established on the north side of the north anna near quarles's ford at a place known as quarles's mills that day it became evident that lee was going to make a permanent stand between the north and the south anna his position was found to be exceedingly strong and was somewhat similar to the one taken up at spotsylvania the lines were shaped something like the letter u with the base resting on the river at ox ford it had one face turned toward hancock and the other toward warren the lines were made exceedingly formidable by means of strong earthworks with heavy obstructions planted in front and were flanked on the right by an impenetrable swamp and on the left by little river general grant said in discussing the situation at this time it now looks as if lee's position were such that it would not be prudent to fight a battle in the narrow space between these two rivers and i shall withdraw our army from its present position and make another flank march to the left but i want while we are here to destroy a portion of the virginia central railroad as that is the road by which lee is receiving a large part of his supplies and reinforcements he ended the conversation by directing me to cross the river and superintend this operation i went with a portion of russell's division of wright's corps which began the work of destruction at a point on the railroad about eight hundred yards from the enemy's extreme left a brigade was extended along one side of the road in single rank and at a given signal the men took hold of the rails lifted up the road and turned it upside down then breaking the rails loose they used them as levers in prying off the cross ties which they piled up at different points laid the rails across them and set fire to the ties as soon as the rails became sufficiently hot they bent in the middle by their own weight efforts were then made to twist them so as to render them still more unserviceable several miles of railway were thus destroyed the reinforcements which general grant had predicted would be sent to lee's army had reached him between twelve thousand and fifteen thousand men arrived from the twenty second to the twenty fifth of may breckinridge had come from the valley of virginia with nearly all of his forces pickett brought a division from the vicinity of richmond and hoke's brigade of early's division had also been sent to lee from the confederate capital on the twenty second as soon as grant had learned the extent of the disaster to butler's army on the james he said that butler was not detaining ten thousand men in richmond and not even keeping the road south of that city broken and he considered it advisable to have the greater part of butler's troops join in the campaign of the army of the potomac on may twenty five he telegraphed orders to halleck saying send butler's forces to white house to land on the north side and march up to join this army the james river should be held to city point but leave nothing more than is absolutely necessary to hold it acting purely on the defensive the enemy will not undertake any offensive operations there but will concentrate everything here at the same time he said if hunter can possibly get to charlottesville and lynchburg he should do so living on the country the railroads and canals should be destroyed beyond the possibility of repair for weeks these instructions were given in consequence of the withdrawal of breckinridge's command which left the valley of virginia undefended when i recrossed the river and returned to headquarters in the evening i found general grant sitting in front of his tent smoking a cigar and anxious to hear the report as to the extent of the damage to the railroad about the time i finished relating to him what had been accomplished an old woman who occupied a small house near by strolled over to headquarters apparently bent upon having a friendly chat with the commander of the yankee armies the number of questions she asked showed that she was not lacking in the quality of curiosity which is supposed to be common to her sex she wore an old-fashioned calico dress about six inches too short with the sleeves rolled up to the elbows 
she had a nose so sharp that it looked as if it had been caught in the crack of a door and small grey eyes that twinkled and snapped as she spoke she began by nodding a familiar how do you do to the general and saying in a voice which squeaked like the high notes of an e-flat clarinet with a soft reed i believe you command all these yer ankies that are comin down here and cabotin around over this whole section of country the general bowed an assent and she continued i'm powerful glad general lee has been lickin you all from the rapidan clan down here and that now he's got you jazz why he wants you then she drew up a camp chair alongside the general seated herself on it and finding that her remarks seemed to be received good-naturedly grew still more familiar and went on to say yes and afore long lee'll be a chasin you all up through pennsylvania again was you up there in pennsylvania when he got after you all last summer the general had great difficulty in keeping his face straight as he replied well no i wasn't there myself i had some business in another direction he did not explain to her that vicksburg was at that time commanding something of his attention said she i notice our boys got away with lots of em conestata horses up there and they brought lots of em back with em we got a pretty good show of em round this section of country and they're just the best draft horses you ever see hope the boys will get up there again soon and bring back some more of em the general kept on smoking his cigar and was greatly amused by the conversation after a little while the woman went back to her house but returned later and said see here i'm all alone in my house and i'm kind of skeered i expect them yankee soldiers of yourn will steal everything i have and murder me a full morning if you don't give me some protection oh replied the general we will see that you are not hurt and turning to lieutenant dunn of the staff he said dunn you had better go and stay in the old lady's house to-night you can probably make yourself more comfortable there than in camp anyhow and i don't want her to be frightened dunn followed the old woman rather reluctantly to her house and played guardian angel to her till the next morning general grant had now presented to him for solution a very formidable military problem lee's position from the strength and location of his entrenchments and the defensive character of the country was impregnable or at least it could not be carried by assault without involving great loss of life the general had therefore decided to withdraw and make another movement by the left flank in the hope of so manoeuvring as to afford another opportunity of getting a chance to strike lee outside his earthworks however a withdrawal in the face of a vigilant foe and the crossing of a difficult river within sight of the enemy constitute one of the most hazardous movements in warfare there was the possibility also that lee might mass his artillery on his left flank and try to hold it by this means and with the minimum of his infantry and with the bulk of his army move out on his right in an attempt to crush hancock's corps this is exactly what grant himself would have done under similar circumstances but he had by this time become familiar with lee's methods and had very little apprehension that he would take the offensive nevertheless hancock was ordered to take every precaution against a possible assault the withdrawal of the army was conducted with consummate skill and furnishes an instructive lesson in warfare in the first place the enemy had to be deceived and thrown off his guard to make the movement at all safe for this purpose wilson's division of cavalry was transferred to the right of the army on may twenty five and ordered to cross the north anna and proceed to little river on lee's extreme left and make a vigorous demonstration to convey the impression that there was a movement of the army in that direction with a view to turning lee's left this was done so effectually that lee telegraphed to richmond the next morning from present indications the enemy seems to contemplate a movement on our left flank during the night of the twenty fifth the trains and all of the artillery which was in position on our right wing were quietly moved to the north bank of the river russell's division of the sixth corps was also withdrawn and moved in the rear of burnside and at daylight the next morning halted in a place where its movements could not be seen by the enemy during the day its position in front of the enemy had been skilfully filled with men from other parts of the command and its absence was not discovered early in the morning of may twenty sixth instructions were issued for the withdrawal of the entire army that night 
after these orders had been dispatched the general seated himself in front of his tent for a quiet smoke in a few minutes the old woman who had had the familiar chat with him the evening before rushed over to his tent in a high state of excitement swinging her arms like the fans of a windmill and screaming at the top of her shrill voice she cried out see here these yankees of yourn got into my barn last night and stole the only horse i had and i want you to send some of your folks out to find em and bring em back the general listened to her story and when she had finished remarked quietly madam perhaps it is one of those conestoga horses you spoke of that belong up in pennsylvania and some of our men have made up their minds to take him back home the old lady at this remark was rather crestfallen and said with a grin well i reckon you got me on that but you yankees had no business down here anyhow and i think you might get me back that hoss the general replied i'm very sorry indeed that this has occurred and if the army were in camp i would send you around with a guard to see whether the horse could be recognized by you and recovered but the troops are moving constantly and it would be utterly impossible to find the animal she finally went off shaking her fist and muttering i'm sartin of one thing anyhow general lee just dust you all off this place afore you can say scat the operations of the last two days had made the duties of staff officers particularly arduous and a great many of us were feeling the effects of the last week's hard work and exposure the loss of sleep and the breathing of a malarious atmosphere in connection with the renewal of the work of destroying the railroad i was sent across the river again on the twenty sixth and on returning that afternoon to headquarters found myself suffering severely from fever and sick headache about dark general grant wished me to make another trip to the extreme right to assist in the work of withdrawing the troops as i was particularly familiar with that part of the lines sickness is no excuse in the field so i started across the river again without making my condition known to the general to make matters worse a thunderstorm came up accompanied by vivid lightning and between the flashes the darkness was so impenetrable that it was slow work finding the roads babcock seeing my condition volunteered to accompany me so that if i gave out the orders i was carrying might still reach their destination we remained in the saddle the greater part of the night on my return to headquarters a surgeon supplied me liberally with round shot in the form of quinine pills which were used so effectively that my fever was soon forced to beat a retreat as soon as it was dark the other divisions of wright's corps had begun the recrossing of the river this corps followed the route which had been taken by russell's division while warren took a road a little farther to the north burnside and hancock next withdrew and so cautiously that their movements entirely escaped detection by the enemy all the corps left strong guards in their fronts which were withdrawn at the last moment the pontoon bridges were taken up after crossing the river and cavalry was sent to the several fords to hold them after they had been abandoned by the infantry and to destroy any facilities for crossing which had been neglected the withdrawal from the north anna had now been successfully accomplished End of chapter nine chapter ten of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten grant crosses the pamunkey maneuvering for position grant interviews a prisoner region of the totopotomy grant seizes old cold harbor w f smith's troops join the army of the potomac grant disciplines a teamster grant's fondness for horses moving into position the halt at bethesda church as soon as all the commands had safely recrossed the north anna general grant set out on the morning of may twenty seven and marched with the troops in the new movements to the left sheridan with two divisions of his cavalry had started east the afternoon of the day before and had moved rapidly to hanover town on the pamunkey a distance of nearly thirty miles on the march the general-in-chief as he rode by was vociferously cheered as usual by the troops every movement directed by him inspired the men with new confidence in his ability and his watchfulness over their interests 
and not only the officers but the rank and file understood fully that he had saved them on the north anna from the slaughter which would probably have occurred if they had been thrown against lee's formidable entrenchments and had had to fight a battle with their backs to a river that he had skilfully withdrawn them without the loss of a man or a wagon and that they were again making an advanced movement the soldiers by this time were getting on intimate terms with their commander in fact becoming quite chummy one man in the ranks touched his hat as the chief rode by and asked is it all right general he received a nod of the head in reply and the words yes i think so another man looked up at him and said in an earnest tone general we'll lick em sure pop next time these remarks were not attempts at undue familiarity but expressions of a genuine sentiment of soldierly fellowship which the men had learned to entertain toward their chief that night general headquarters were established at mangolic church about twenty miles in a southeasterly direction from quarles's ford the cavalry had been handled with great skill it made a feint as if to cross at little pages and taylor's fords on the pamunkey and after dark moved rapidly to hanover ferry about twelve miles farther down the stream where the actual crossing took place on the morning of the twenty seventh it was followed by russell's division of infantry the rest of the troops had made a good march and soon after midday on may twenty eighth wright hancock and warren had crossed the river and gone into position about a mile and a half beyond burnside had reached the ferry but remained on the north side to guard the trains general grant had pushed on to hanover ferry and expressed himself as greatly pleased at the success of the movement he had abundant reason to congratulate himself upon the thorough carrying out of his instructions in each of his three attempts to move close to lee's troops and cross difficult rivers in his very face grant had been completely successful and had manoeuvred so as to accomplish a most formidable task in warfare with insignificant loss in the operations of the last few days general grant had employed with wonderful skill his chief military characteristics of quickness of thought celerity of action and fertility of resource while his plans were always well matured and much thought and investigation were expended upon perfecting them in advance yet they were sufficiently general in their nature to admit readily of those changes which often have to be made upon the instant in consequence of some unanticipated movement of the enemy or some unexpected discovery in the topography of the field of operations it seemed a little singular to him that lee after falling back behind the north anna river had allowed the union army to advance across that difficult stream without any substantial resistance and that when across he had made a stand with his back to another river the south anna and remained there entirely passive and that three days afterward he had permitted the union army to withdraw across the north anna under his very nose without even attacking its rear guards it was these circumstances which made grant say at this time and also write to the government lee's army is really whipped a battle with them outside of entrenchments cannot be had our base of supplies was now transferred from port royal to white house on the york river before describing the personal incidents connected with what is known as the cold harbor campaign it is important to give the reader a general idea of the character of the country in which the manoeuvring and fighting occurred hanover town near which place our army had now been concentrated is about seventeen miles in a straight line northeast from richmond the country is crossed by two streams totopotomy creek and the chickahominy river both running in a southeasterly direction the latter being about four miles from richmond at the nearest point between these are a number of smaller creeks and rivulets their banks are low and their approach is swampy and covered with woods and thickets three main roads lead from hanover town to richmond the most northerly is called the hanover town or shady grove road the second route the mechanicsville road and the third and most southerly which runs through old cold harbor new cold harbor and gaines mill is known as the cold harbor road old cold harbor halfway between hanover town and richmond consisted merely of a few scattered houses but its strategic position was important for reasons which will hereafter appear 
new cold harbor was little more than the intersection of crossroads about a mile and a half west of old cold harbor it was at first supposed that cold harbor was a corruption of the phrase cool arbor and the shade trees in the vicinity seemed to suggest such a name but it was ascertained afterward that the name cold harbor was correct that it had been taken from the places frequently found along the highways of england and means shelter without fire on may twenty eighth sheridan was pushed out toward mechanicsville to discover the enemy's position and after a sharp fight at hawes shop drove a body of the enemy out of some earthworks in which it was posted that night the ninth corps crossed the river wilson's cavalry divisions remained on the north side until the morning of the thirtieth to cover the crossing of the trains general headquarters had crossed the pamunkey on the pontoon bridge in the afternoon of may twenty eighth after a hard dusty ride and had gone into camp on the south side in the meantime lee had moved his entire army rapidly from the north anna and thrown it between our army and richmond on the morning of the twenty ninth wright hancock and warren were directed to move forward and make a reconnaissance in force which brought about some spirited fighting the movement disclosed the fact that all of lee's troops were in position on the north side of the chickahominy and were well entrenched general grant was particularly anxious that evening to obtain information of the enemy from some inside source several prisoners had been taken and one of them who was disposed to be particularly talkative was brought in to headquarters it being thought that the general might like to examine him in person he was a tall slim shock-headed comical-looking creature and proved to be so full of native humour that i give the portion of his conversation which afforded us the most amusement he of course did not know in whose presence he was as he rattled off his quick-witted remarks what command do you belong to asked the general i'm an earless corps and i belong to a north carolina regiment sir was the reply oh you're from north carolina remarked the general yes said the prisoner and a good deal farther from it just now than i'd like to be god knows well where were you taken and how did you get here was the next asked how'd i get here well when a man has half a dozen of them thou reckless and disparate dagoons o yourn lammin him round the road on a tight run and wallopin him with the flats of their sabres and don't have no trouble gettin here is your whole corps in our front and when did it arrive inquired the general well now just let me tell you about that said the prisoner and let me begin right from the start i'm not going to fool you cause i'm fast losing interest in this fight i was a peaceful man and i didn't want to hurt nobody when a conscript officer down thar in the old tar state came round and told me i'd have to get into the ranks and go to fighting for my rights i tried to have him point them out for me i told him i'd as lief have em all but i wasn't strenuous about it then he began to put on more airs than a buckin' horse at a county fair and told me to come right along that the country wanted me well i had noticed that our folks was losin a good many battles that you all was too much for em and i got to flatterin myself that perhaps it was only right for me to go and jine our army just to kind o even things up but matters has been goin pretty rough with us ever since and i'm gettin to feel peacefuller and peacefuller every day they're feedin us half the time on crumbs and there's one boy in my company that's got so thin you have to throw a tent fly over him to get up a respectable shadow then they have a way of campin us alongside of creeks not much bigger than a slate pencil and you have to be powerful quick about gettin what water you want or some thirsty cow will come along and drink up the whole stream i thought from all the fuss she had made at the start that south carolina was going to fight the whole wall through herself and make it a picnic for the rest of us but when thar's real trouble she has to get the old tar state to do the solid work are there any men from south carolina in your brigade was the next question the answer came with a serio comic expression of countenance yes a few in the band the general suppressed the laugh with which he was now struggling and feeling that an effort to get any useful information from the north carolinian would be a slow process disappeared into his tent to attend to some correspondence and left the prisoner to be further interviewed by the staff i tell you gentlemen went on the confederate there's lots of cobwebs in my throat and i could talk to you all a good deal better if i only had a dish of liquor 
thus nothing braces a man up like taking a little of the tanglefoot thereupon a canteen and cup were brought and after the man had poured out about four fingers of commissary whisky and tossed it off as if it were water he looked considerably invigorated nothing as soothin as corn juice after all he continued i like to live in kaintucky them kaintucky fellers say they can walk right into a cornfield strip off an ear and just squeeze a drink o whisky right out in it how did you happen to be picked up was now asked well you see sir he replied our captain jimmy skipworth marched me out on his picket line captain jimmy's one of them the slack twisted loose belted toggle gente kind of fellers that sends you straight out to the front and if you don't get killed right off why he gets all out of patience and thinks you want to live for ever you can't get away because he's always keeping tab on you when he marched us out to-day i says to him cap'n jimmy thou want peer to be enough of the boys a-comin' along with us now i tell you when we go to monkey em with em yankees we ought to have plenty of company we don't want to feel lonesome well we got there and went the diggin a ditch so we could flop down in it and protect our heads and could use it afterward for bearin you all in it if we could get hold of you well just then you opened lively and come up at us a whoopin and a careerin like sin and as for me i took a header for the ditch the boy saw something drop and i didn't make any effort to pick it up again till the misunderstandin was over the fust thing i knowed after that you lighted on to me yanked me out of the hole and then turned me over to some o you dragoons and lord how they did run me into your lines and so here i am after the provost marshal's people had been told to take the prisoner to the rear and treat him well the man before moving on said now man i would like mighty well to see that that newfangled weepin o yours that shoots like it was a whole platoon that tell me you can load it up on sunday and fire it off all the rest of the week he had derived this notion from the spencer carbine the new magazine gun which fired seven shots in rapid succession after this exhibition of his talent for dialogue he was marched off to join the other prisoners on may thirty wright hancock and warren engaged the enemy in their respective fronts which led to some active skirmishing the enemy's skirmishers being in most places strongly entrenched burnside this day crossed the totopotomoy early's formerly ewell's corps moved out with the evident intention of turning our left and made a heavy attack but was repulsed and forced to fall back after suffering a severe loss particularly in field officers about noon grant received word that transports bringing w f smith's troops from butler's army were beginning to arrive at white house and they were ordered to move forward at once and join the army of the potomac general grant thought that it was not improbable that the enemy would endeavor to throw troops around our left flank in the hope of striking smith a crushing blow before we could detach a force from the army of the potomac to prevent it sheridan was directed to watch for such a movement and an infantry brigade was sent out early that morning to join smith and march back with him so as to strengthen his forces general grant said at this time nothing would please me better than to have the enemy make a movement around our left flank i would in that case move the whole army to the right and throw it between lee and richmond but this opportunity did not arise on may thirty the general headquarters had been established in a clearing on the north side of the shady grove road about a mile and three-quarters west of hawes shop general grant this day sent a dispatch to halleck at washington saying i wish you would send all the pontoon bridging you can to city point to have it ready in case it is wanted as early as may twenty six staff officers had been sent from the army of the potomac to collect all the bridging material at command and hold it in readiness this was done in order to be prepared to cross the james river if deemed best and attack richmond and petersburg from the south side and carry out the views expressed by grant in the beginning of the wilderness campaign as to his movements in certain contingencies it was seen by him from the operations of the thirtieth that the enemy was working his way southward by extending his right flank with a view to securing old cold harbor and holding the roads running from that point toward the james river and white house this would cut off grant's short route to the james in case he should decide to cross that river and would also command the principal line of communication with his base at white house 
old cold harbor was therefore a point much desired by both the contending generals and the operations of the thirty first were watched with much interest to see which army would secure the prize that morning my orders took me to the extreme left in connection with the movements of the cavalry sheridan advanced rapidly from old cold harbor attacked a body of the enemy entrenched there and after a severe fight carried the position the place however was too important to be abandoned by the enemy without a further struggle and he soon returned bringing up a force so large that it appeared for a time impossible for sheridan to hold his position finding no troops advancing to his support the only course which seemed open to him was to fall back but just as he had withdrawn he received an order to hold the place at all hazards until reinforcements could reach him with his usual zeal and boldness he now reoccupied the enemy's breastworks dismounted his men and determined to make a desperate struggle to hold the position against whatever force might be sent against him darkness set in however before the enemy made another assault in anticipation of a hard fight for the possession of cold harbor general grant had ordered wright's corps to make a night march and move to sheridan's relief lee discovering this ordered anderson's corps to cold harbor on sheridan's front during the night we could distinctly hear the enemy's troops making preparations for the next morning's attack and could even hear some of the commands given by their officers soon after daylight on june one the assault began sheridan kept quiet till the attacking party came within a short distance of his breastworks and then opened with a destructive fire under which the enemy fell back in considerable confusion he soon rallied however and rushed again to the assault but once more recoiled before sheridan's well-delivered volleys wright had been instructed to arrive at daylight but the night march had been exceptionally difficult and the head of his column did not appear until nine o'clock the troops were footsore and jaded but they moved promptly into line and relieved sheridan's little force which had been fighting desperately against great odds for about four hours grant had secured old cold harbor and won the game smith's corps consisted of thirteen thousand men he left about two thousand five hundred to guard white house and with the rest started for the front reaching there at three o'clock in the afternoon of june one at five o'clock wright's and smith's commands advanced and captured the earthworks in their front taking about seven hundred and fifty prisoners the enemy had made three attacks upon warren but had been handsomely repulsed hancock and burnside had also been attacked no doubt to prevent them from sending troops to reinforce our left the enemy seemed roused to desperation in his struggle to gain the much coveted strategic point at old cold harbor and made several savage attacks in that direction during the night but they were all successfully repelled in gaining and holding the important position sought the union army that day lost nearly two thousand men in killed and in wounded the enemy probably suffered to about the same extent headquarters were moved about two miles this day june one to the via house which was half a mile south of totopotomoy creek on the road leading from hawes shop to bethesda church before starting the general servant asked whether he should saddle jeff davis the horse grant had been riding for two days no was the reply we are getting into a rather swampy country and i fear little jeff's legs are not quite long enough for wading through the mud you'd better saddle egypt this horse was large in size and a medium-coloured bay he was called egypt not because he had come from the region of the nile but from the junction of the mississippi and ohio rivers in southern illinois a section of the country named after the land of the ptolemies when the horse was brought up the general mounted as usual in a manner peculiar to himself he made no perceptible effort and used his hands but little to aid him he put his left foot in a stirrup grasped the horse's mane near the withers with his left hand and rose without making a spring by simply straightening the left leg till his body was high enough to enable him to throw the right leg over the saddle there was no climbing up the animal's side and no jerky movements the mounting was always done in an instant and with the greatest possible ease rawlins rode with the general at the head of the staff 
as the party turned a bend in the road near the crossing of the totopotomoy the general came in sight of a teamster whose wagon was stalled in a place where it was somewhat swampy and who was standing beside his team beating his horses brutally in the face with the butt end of his whip and swearing with a volubility calculated to give a sulphurous odor to all the surrounding atmosphere grant's aversion to profanity and his love of horses caused all the ire in his nature to be aroused by the sight presented putting both spurs into egypt's flanks he dashed toward the teamster and raising his clenched fist called out to him what does this conduct mean you scoundrel stop beating those horses the teamster looked at him and said coolly as he delivered another blow aimed at the face of the wheel horse well who's driving this team anyway you or me the general was now thoroughly angered and his manner was by no means as angelic as that of the celestial being who called a halt when balaam was disciplining the ass i'll show you you infernal villain he cried shaking his fist in the man's face then calling to an officer of the escort he said take this man in charge and have him tied up to a tree for six hours as a punishment for his brutality the man slunk off sullenly in charge of the escort to receive his punishment without showing any penitence for his conduct he was evidently a hardened case of course he was not aware that the officer addressing him was the general-in-chief but he evidently knew that he was an officer of high rank as he was accompanied by a staff and an escort so that there was no excuse for the insubordinate and insolent remark during the stirring scenes of that day's battle the general twice referred to the incident in vehement language showing that the recollection of it was still rankling in his mind this was the one exhibition of temper manifested by him during the entire campaign and the only one i ever witnessed during my many years of service with him i remarked that night to colonel bowers who had served with his chief ever since the fort donelson campaign the general to-day gave us his first exhibition of anger did you ever see him fire up in that way in his earlier campaigns never but once said bowers and that was in the Yuka campaign one day on the march he came across a straggler who had stopped at a house and assaulted a woman the general sprang from his horse seized a musket from the hands of a soldier and struck the culprit over the head with it sending him sprawling to the ground he always had a peculiar horror of such crimes they were very rare in our war but when brought to his attention the general showed no mercy to the culprit grant and meade rode along the lines that day and learned from personal observation the general features of the topography about noon they stopped at rice headquarters and the commander of the sixth corps gave the party some delicious ice water he had found an ice house near his headquarters and after a hot and dusty ride since daylight the cool draught was gratefully relished by those whose thirst it slaked the previous winter had been unusually cold and an abundance of ice had formed upon the streams in virginia the well-filled ice-houses found on the line of march were a great boon to the wounded general wright had assumed command of the sixth corps at a critical period of the campaign and under very trying circumstances but he had conducted it with such heroic gallantry and marked ability that he had commended himself highly to both grant and meade that night the variety of food at the headquarters mess was increased by the arrival of a supply of oysters received by way of white house shellfish were among the few dishes which tempted the general's appetite and as he had been living principally on roast beef and hard bread during the whole campaign and had not eaten enough of these to sustain life in an ordinary person every one was delighted that evening when sitting down at the mess table to see the general attack the oysters with evident relish and make a hearty meal of them thereafter every effort was made to get a supply of that species of seafood as often as possible at the dinner-table he referred again to the brutality of the teamsters saying if people knew how much more they could get out of a horse by gentleness than by harshness they would save a great deal of trouble both to the horse and the man a horse is a particularly intelligent animal he can be made to do almost anything if his master has intelligence enough to let him know what is required some men for instance when they want to lead a horse forward turn toward him and stare him in the face he of course thinks they are barring his way and he stands still if they would turn their back to him and move on he would naturally follow 
i am looking forward longingly to the time when we can end this war and i can settle down on my st louis farm and raise horses i love to train young colts and i will invite you all to visit me and take a hand in the amusement when the old age comes on and i get too feeble to move about i expect to derive my chief pleasure from sitting in a big armchair in the centre of a ring a sort of training course holding a colt's leading line in my hand and watching him run around the ring he little foresaw that a torturing disease was to cut short his life before he could realize his cherished hopes of enjoying the happiness of the peaceful old age which he anticipated no warrior was ever more anxious for peace and all of the general's references to the pending strife evinced his constant longing for the termination of the struggle upon terms which would secure forever the integrity of the union when he prepared his letter of acceptance of his first nomination for the presidency he wrote no random phrase but expressed the genuine sentiments of his heart when he said let us have peace the night of the first of june was a busy one for both officers and men grant eager as usual to push the advantage gained set about making such disposition of the troops as would best accomplish this purpose hancock was ordered to move after nightfall from the extreme right to the extreme left of the army the night was extremely dark especially when passing through the woods no one was familiar with the roads the heat was intense and the dust stifling but notwithstanding all the difficulties encountered hancock arrived at old cold harbor on the morning of june two after a march of over twelve miles as the men were greatly exhausted however from hunger and fatigue they had to be given an opportunity to rest and eat their rations and it was found impossible to make a formidable assault until five o'clock in the afternoon warren and burnside were both attacked while they were moving their troops but they repelled all assaults and caused the enemy considerable loss at daylight on june two the headquarters were moved about two miles south to a camp near bethesda church so as to be nearer the centre of the line which had been extended toward the left upon reaching the church and while waiting for the arrival of the wagons and the pitching of the tents a number of important orders were issued the pews had been carried out of the church and placed in the shade of the trees surrounding it the general-in-chief and his officers seated themselves in the pews while the horses were taken to a little distance in the rear the ubiquitous photographers were promptly on the ground and they succeeded in taking several fairly good views of the group a supply of new york papers had just been received and the party with the exception of the general were soon absorbed in reading the news he was too much occupied at the time in thinking over his plans for the day to give attention to the papers and was content to hear from the staff a summary of anything of importance mentioned in the press he was usually a diligent reader of the newspapers and of all current literature there was one new york morning journal which claimed a special previous knowledge of his movements and made some very clever guesses concerning his plans he used to call this paper his organ and upon the arrival of the mail he would generally pick it up first and remark now let me see what my organ has to say and then i can tell better what i am going to do a large delegation of the christian commission had arrived at white house and was now moving up toward the lines with a supply train which carried many comforts for the wounded i saw among the number a person whom i recognized as the pastor of a church which i had attended some years before he was trudging along like the others in his shirt sleeves wearing a broad-brimmed slouch hat and was covered with virginia dust i presented him to general grant and the rest of the officers and then brought up a number of the other members of the commission and presented them in turn general grant rose to his feet shook hands with them and greeted them all with great cordiality then resuming his seat he said sit down gentlemen and rest you look tired after your march they thanked him and several of them took seats in the church pews near him though considering their professional training most of them would have doubtless felt more at home in the pulpit than in the pews the general continued by saying i am very glad to see you coming to the army on your present mission unfortunately you will find an extensive field for your work my greatest concern in this campaign is the care of the large number of wounded our surgeons have been unremitting in their labors and i know you can be of great assistance 
the gentleman replied we have brought with us everything that we thought could minister to the comfort of the wounded and we will devote ourselves religiously to the work after the general had assured them that they should have all necessary transportation put at their disposal they bid him good-bye and continued their march his parting words were remember gentlemen whatever instructions you may receive let your first care be for the wounded before leaving they expressed to the staff their great delight in having had this unexpected chat with the commander of the armies and having been treated by him with so much consideration the christian commission as well as the sanitary commission was often of inestimable service to the wounded and many a gallant fellow owed his life to its kindly and devoted ministerings End of chapter ten